In this lecture, we will talk about the legal, ethical, and diversity issues related to counseling assessment. It's important for us to talk about these issues because the practice of assessment, particularly testing, is quite regulated. It's also a practice that many clients find unnerving and challenging. Several misconceptions regarding the true intention of testing practices have given people a negative perception of the activity. As a result, as professionals, it is incumbent upon us to ensure that our work follows legal and ethical standards to best safeguard the public. So let's look at the two terms, legal and ethical. When we talk about ethics, we're talking about what a person should or should not do. They're based in morality, and they're determined by particular organizations. Each professional organization has their own set of ethical standards. These standards form the principles or foundation for what is considered normal, acceptable conduct. For that reason, ethical codes are usually seen as minimum competencies or minimum standards. These are the behaviors that professionals in that profession are expected to adhere to. Laws refer to legal mandates. This is what someone has to do. Laws can be determined by legislators, federal governments, state or local municipalities. A law is put in place to safeguard the public. For example, we have speed limits on our roads, highways, and interstates. Those speed limits are laws passed to ensure safety for motorists traveling on those roads. The ethical guidelines we use are in place to combat negative public perceptions. By setting forth a list of standards of practice to be followed, practitioners demonstrate to the general public that they are in fact following closely monitored standards of practice. As a counselor, there are several sources of ethical codes for you to be aware of. Depending on your specialty area or area of practice, there may or may not be multiple codes in which you would need to be familiar. The most prominent source of ethical information is the ACA Code of Ethics. The ACA Code of Ethics is created by the American Counseling Association. Roughly every 10 years, a new version emerges. The Code of Ethics is a collaboration of members throughout the organization. A special committee is formed to revise the standards and code. Feedback is sought from members of the organization, and the new codes go into place. One of the benefits of the Code of Ethics is that it is adaptable and simple. Changes in the codes reflect changes in our society. <laughs> 
the ACA Code of Ethics is in place for all members who join the American Counseling Association. As the largest professional counseling organization in the world, ACA currently has over 54,000 members. Specific to assessment related practices, counselors can find ethical information in the RUST statement. The RUST statement, which stands for the Responsible Use of Standardized Tests, was first published in 2003 by the Association for Assessment in Counseling. That organization is one of the divisions of ACA, and this past year changed its name to the Association for Assessment and Research in Counseling. The Rust Statement includes a set of standards and ethical principles that guide the various components of the test process. It specifies what counselors need to be aware of and consider in terms of selecting, administering, scoring, and interpreting test results. A similar document is the Code of Fair Testing Practices in Education. This document was made available for those working in the school systems, engaged in testing and assessment, it details how tests should be administered and scored when working with children. Another document that's helpful is the rights and responsibilities of test takers. This is actually an ethical guideline that is given to clients. It specifies for clients what will be expected of them and what they can expect to occur in the testing process. Included in the rights and responsibilities of test takers are such items as claiming the right to their results being kept confidential. Clients have the right to instruments being selected that best meet their personal needs. Clients have the responsibility of asking questions when clarification is needed. Copy these three instruments, the Rust Statement, the Code of Fair Testing Practices, and the Rights and Responsibilities of Test Takers are available on the Blackboard page. I would encourage you to take a look at these documents and see what some of the standards are pertaining to the testing and assessment interventions we use. A final source of ethical information is the KCREP standards. KCREP is the organization that accredits counselor training programs. They specify what it is that graduates of a program are expected to learn or know as a result of their coursework. There are eight common core components to counselor training programs that KCREP evaluates, one of those being assessment. And there are standards that talk about what students should learn in an assessment course. To familiarize yourself with what it is that KCREP requires, you can look at our course syllabus as the learning objectives align with the KCREP standards.
Generally speaking, there are some fundamental principles that all of these documents and all of these codes include. The amount of tension and detail that is devoted to each of these may vary from document to document, but the topics are highlighted in all. Ethically, we as counselors need to maintain professional competence. We should ensure that our training and skills are up to date. We're familiar with current instruments or measures that are coming out. And we're only using those instruments for which we've been fully trained to use. We promote integrity within the discipline. Using tests in a professional manner helps make them a more accepted and valued part of the counseling relationship. We uphold professional standards and ensure respect for human rights. In the past, there have been documented cases of misuses of tests. We'll talk about some towards the end of this lecture. For that reason, many people are skeptical that tests are a violation of their rights. And so as counselors, we need to work to dispel that myth and act in a manner that ensures individual rights are safeguarded. Ethically, we also should practice assessment in a approach that contributes to society. There should be some gain or some positive from the assessment process. And then finally, there is our civic responsibility. As members of society ourselves, what is our responsibility to those who serve and those with whom we live in our communities? So those are some general principles. More specifically, we could look at standards in the ACA guidelines that are specific to assessment. For example, ethical standard E1B states that counselors are responsible for the appropriate application, scoring, interpretation and use of assessment instruments, whether they score and interpret such tests themselves or use computerized or other services. Basically what this is saying is that you are responsible for the entire testing process. The buck stops you. It is your responsibility to make sure that the correct and appropriate test is selected and used, that it is administered correctly, scored accurately, and is integrated into the counseling process and not used as a single marker or identifier of a client's issues or disorders present. You'll note that it also states that you're responsible for these components, even if using a computerized or mail-in test. You cannot blame the computer for scoring it incorrectly or malfunctioning. As the counselor, you're responsible. So make sure when you select tests that you will not directly be scoring or administering that you're choosing ones that are reliable and have been proven effective in the past. Standard E2A 
states that counselors recognize the limits of their competence and perform only those testing and assessment services for which they have been trained. Furthermore, counselors take reasonable measures to ensure the proper use of psychological assessment techniques by persons they supervise. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of assessment instruments available for you to use. It is incumbent upon you to select only those for which you are qualified to use. By qualifications, I'm referring to educational background, correct degree, certification, or licensure status, as well as any previous experience using that instrument. Even though a new instrument may come out, it may be the hot new trend to use, we should refrain from using it if we have not been properly trained or exposed to it in the past. Standard E3A states that prior to assessment, counselors explain the nature and purposes of the assessment and the specific use of results by potential recipients. The explanation will be given in the language of the client unless an explicit exception has been agreed upon in advance. Part of the informed consent process is informing your clients what will happen or take place in the testing process. What can they expect? What will happen with the results? Who will have access to them? In addition to crafting an informed consent document, you also might consider giving your clients a copy of the rights and responsibilities of test takers prior to using any assessment or testing interventions. Standards E5A and E5B talk about the use of assessments with special populations. In E5A, we talk about taking special care to provide a proper diagnosis of mental disorders, wherein assessment techniques that are used to determine a client's care are carefully selected and appropriately used. Because of the importance of the decisions we make and the potential negative impact a misdiagnosed label may have on a client, it's important that we make sure the instruments we use are appropriate for use with this client. Similarly, in E5B, counselors are encouraged to consider culture and background when defining a client's problem. Test results should not be interpreted in a vacuum. We need to consider the ecological background and environment from which client comes. When we interpret results in the context of their home environment, we get a more valid understanding of what's truly going on with this client. 
Each of these standards appear in the 2005 ACA Code of Ethics and also appeared in previous versions as well. There are ethical standards that we as counselors have been abiding by for decades. A new area where we see ethical standards needing to be applied is in forensic evaluations. Forensics is a growing field. Counselors participating in forensic evaluations need to adhere to certain ethical standards. They need to make sure that they're providing objective findings that can be substantiated. In a forensic evaluation, there is no room for subjective opinion. Individual clients who are meeting with a counselor for a forensic evaluation are to be informed in writing that the relationship is evaluative and not a counseling relationship. That means that the same expectation or rights that a client would expect from a counselor in terms of confidentiality do not apply. In a forensic evaluation, the counselor or evaluator is typically hired by the court system. Third, counselors do not evaluate clients for forensic purposes that they're already working with in a counseling relationship. Your objectivity is compromised. Your knowledge of the client's background and history could potentially cloud your judgment. And this client should be referred to another therapist for the evaluative component. And then finally, counselors should avoid any dual relationships or potential dual relationships with individuals related to those who they are evaluating. The perception may be much worse than reality. And to avoid any difficulties in the future, counselors should refrain from these types of relationships. With all of these ethical challenges and issues, counselors are reminded to ethical decision-making model, as it's a good way to cover your bases and make sure what you're doing adheres to ethical standards. And we presented the ethical decision-making model to you. First, you identify the problem. What is it that seems to be a tricky subject? You apply the appropriate code of ethics which standards relate to or pertain to what is going on at the moment. You determine the nature and dimensions of the problem. Generate potential courses of action. Consider the consequences of each of these options. Select one and then implement that question. Following this model is good standard practice for beginning and experienced counselors alike. Documents, the Rust Statement,
and the rights and responsibilities that are available on the Blackboard page. One of the responsibilities of test users is to make sure that they are qualified. That involves the training as well as the need to perform the assessment. Questions that you should be asking or hoping to identify answers to are what's the purpose of testing? Why is testing needed at this time? What are the characteristics of the tests? Are they individual or group administered? Paper and pencil or computer based? Projective or standardized? What are the conditions of the test? How will the results be useful and applicable to our work with the client? And finally, what is your role as the selector and administrator? Are you allowed to answer questions? Offer prompts? Is it verbally or orally administered? Or do you simply hand the packet to the client and wait for them to complete it? Some of the areas that are covered in the rights and responsibilities of test takers document. Clients have the responsibility to first know their responsibilities, to only take tests that have high standards, ask questions whenever they are confused or require clarification, to listen to or read the directions of the test, depending on whether it's orally administered or passed out, to know the location and schedule of the test, when and where will it be given, to follow all instructions, report any unfair test conditions, whether it was too cold, too noisy, and to ask about confidentiality. How does that pertain to this particular test? Who will and will not have access to the results? Council responsibilities include appropriately selecting tests to be used, safeguarding the clients. We can safeguard clients by protecting against invasions of privacy, making sure that we keep in a secure place all testing instruments and ancillary materials. We can only disclose test results to those that the client has given us to or that are on a need-to-know basis to assist in a client's care. We maintain client's confidentiality and we try to use the least stigmatizing label. Assessments and tests should not be used to place a pejorative label on a client. And our responsibilities continue throughout the testing process. From our initial research geared at selecting a test to use, all the way through after our administration, and we've scored and interpreted the test with the client, to keeping the material safeguarded for as long as may be required by federal, state, or agency regulations. And lastly, our responsibility is to educate our clients. Education is a continual process that takes place throughout the assessment intervention. 
prior to testing, these are some of the areas in which we should educate our clients. We should work with them to understand the purpose of the test, why we chose that test, what they will be asked to do, where they will be tested, what questions look like, perhaps even sharing a sample question or two, and then talking about how scores are computed and what happens with those scores. How are they used? What weight is placed on them in terms of determining a treatment plan or conceptualization of a client? After the test, we should share with clients any unusual testing conditions any behavioral observations we noted. With an individual test, you have a greater chance of observing client behavior during the testing process. How was the client responding? Did it appear that they were calm and collected? Were they nervous, anxious, agitated? And we also could share the time and date of the test with clients and how that may impact their results. If testing young children, you'll probably find differing results if you test them at 9 o'clock in the morning on a Monday or Tuesday than if you tested them at 2.30 Friday afternoon. It could be the same test but the difference in time and day can be significant. So now that we've discussed ethical issues, I want to shift our attention to some legal issues. And there have been a number of legal precedents and laws and down throughout the years that have a connection to or some type of influence on the testing and assessment process. And to help you become familiar with them, I'd like to briefly identify what some of these are and how they relate to the practice of testing and assessment. The first legal precedent we could talk about is FERPA. FERPA stands for the Family Education Right to Privacy Act. It came about in 1974 and basically FERPA gave parents the right to inspect the child's academic records. Schools no longer maintain the ability to hide or sequester a student's records from his or her parents. As part of their academic record, parents also had the right to view their child's test scores. Furthermore, parents also have the ability to determine who gets access to the rec, who can they be shown to or released to. Similar to FERPA is HIPAA. HIPAA stands for Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. It was signed into law in 1996 and basically it's a version of FERPA for all non-education related settings. Your doctor's office, your therapist, your dentist, all 
fall under HIPAA regulations. Client, you're subjected to several rights. You have the right to request certain restrictions on certain disclosures. You have the right to receive confidential communication. You have the right to inspect and copy your information, look at your chart, request a copy of your chart if you'd like to. You have the right to amend health information. If you note in your chart that there is an error or a piece of incorrect information, you could request that that be corrected. And you also have a right to accounting all disclosures. Who has had access to your record? What have they been able to see? The Civil Rights Act of 1991 contained language that applied to the practice of assessment, particularly in educational settings. For one, it codified testing principles. This added to the validity of tests. Tests had to be created in such a way that produced accurate results and that accurately measured the construct for which they were designed to measure. The Civil Rights Act also abolished the use of separate norming groups. There could not be separate norm groups now for different ethnic or racial groups. The norm group had to be global and representative of the nation. Individuals now could compare their scores to those of the general population to see where they stand. The Americans with Disabilities Act, 1990, stipulated that reasonable and appropriate testing accommodations needed to be provided to individuals with disabilities. Examples of accommodations may include extending the time, giving someone longer to take the test, providing an alternate location to take the test, perhaps a individual room where distractions are minimized. It could also include providing a different form of the test, perhaps one with a larger font that's easier to read. If you look at the language, it talks about reasonable and appropriate testing accommodations. The word reasonable is put in to let organizations know that their responsibility is to provide to the best of their means and abilities accommodations for these individuals. Should that accommodation significantly interfere with that company conducting its day-to-day -day business, that accommodation need not necessarily be met exactly as requested. So if a student with a documented disability comes to a university and requests that exams be administered open book and that the student have three weeks to complete the exam, that may be an unreasonable request and does not necessarily have to be met under the letter of this law.
Public Law 94-142 mandated fair and equitable access to education for everyone. Everyone had a right to a public school education. By using the term everyone, it includes individuals from special populations. And so what the law stipulates is that educators, and as an extension counselors, are responsible for identifying and providing education that meets the needs of this special population in the least restrictive method possible. An extension of this law in 1986 was PL, or Public Law 99457. It essentially took 94 142 and expanded it. Now the same rights and privileges were extended to children ages 3 to 5. So it now covered preschool. The final legal act or federal act we could look at is the Individuals with Disability Education Act. Initially in 1990, revised in 1997, IDEA stipulates that multiple testing methods should be used when diagnosing disabilities. No single piece of data should be the sole reason an individual is diagnosed. It should be a decision that is corroborated or triangulated using multiple pieces of data. In addition, counselors need to consider both cognitive and behavioral factors or deficits in their assessment. An individual must have impairment in both areas to meet criteria for diagnosis. Another legal component we could look at that many may not consider is the creation of the EEOC the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. The 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution guarantees all citizens due process and equal protection under the law. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act was passed, and a part of that, Title VII, was the mandate that formed EEOC. Part of the EEOC's duties are to ensure that fair standards and practices are used in employment settings and employee selection procedures. In 1970, guidelines were distributed so that organizations that received public or government funding or employed public, state, or federal employees had to follow EEOC regulations. Discrimination could not be based on, and the laundry list of different protected categories recognized by ADA is included. Each of these laws were designed and put into place to protect the public. 
Sometimes the public is unprotected and change need to be made. The following are some important legal precedents and court cases that have occurred throughout the years where the misuse creation of tests and test data have clearly violated rights of individuals. These court decisions also change the way we provide mental health services, especially testing and assessment services, to our clients. There are five basic court cases that we'll discuss. The first is Griggs versus Duke Power Company. In the 1960s, Duke Power Company, which is a energy company that was located in the southeastern United States, had a policy Whereas African American employee, potential employees were not eligible to apply for management positions or office positions. They were only allowed to be line workers, poll setters. A class action lawsuit was filed on behalf of many of these workers, arguing that this was a form of segregation and a policy that should be abolished. In response to the lawsuit, Duke Power changed their hiring practices. Now, race or cultural background was no longer a criteria for hiring or admissions into their management positions. To be placed in management positions, employees had to demonstrate that they had a high school diploma and they had to successfully pass two aptitude tests. At the time, many African Americans did not have high school diplomas, did not have much formal academic training. And so on these basis, they did not meet criteria. They did not have their degree, and they did not do well on these tests. A second lawsuit was brought, this time arguing discriminatory practices. The courts ruled in favor of the employees, stating that neither requirement, the high school diploma or the aptitude test scores, measured skills needed for the job. Their ruling stated that any criteria placed for applicants of a job must be related to the job duties expected to be performed. If none of the duties being performed required a high school diploma, a high school diploma cannot be used in the application criteria. A second lawsuit we can look at is Larry P. versus Riles. In the 19, late 1960s, 1970s, the Department of Education in California used standardized IQ tests to determine placement in special education programs. The IQ score received was the sole determinant for who made it into special education programs and who did not. What they found in California were that minorities 
were overrepresented in special education programs. In 1969, minorities made up 9% of the population in California, but 27% of the population in special education programs. Because there is a tendency and a historical effect of minorities scoring lower on standardized intelligence tests, the courts ruled that additional criteria was needed for special education placement. The IQ test could not be the sole indicator. The courts also ruled that appropriate norm groups were needed. The norm group should be diverse and take into account and include members from all different cultural or ethnic backgrounds. A third case was Deborah P. versus Turlington. In Florida, they had a policy where high school students were required to pass an end-of-year competency test at the end of their senior year. A successful passing score on this test was a requirement to receive your diploma, regardless of your performance in high school to date. So in other words, you could have had a 4.0 average throughout all four years of your high school. But if you did not pass the end of the year exam, you would not graduate. What they found was a disparity in the pass rates. 98% of all white students were passing the exam while only 80% of African-American students were passing the exam. Upon further inspection, what they found was that the test was developed and created based on the curriculum being taught at many of the more affluent school districts. Some of the poorer school districts or more rural school districts where resources were limited and the availability of qualified teachers to teach certain classes was non-existent, students at those schools were not being exposed to the material that was on the test. As a result, they may have been bright students, but they were being tested on information they had never seen. It would be similar to all of you being subjected to a final exam in this class that was in Russian. You may be good students, but if you don't speak Russian, you would not do well on the test. What the courts ruled was that statewide competency exams could be used, but they had to test a common curriculum, and they had to be placed well in advance. Individuals needed to know that this was going to be the new approach. Those of you in education now familiar with Common Core coming in, which is an attempt to standardize the curriculum across all schools. How successful this practice will be is still to be determined. While statewide exams are prohibited, if they do not test a common curriculum, they are allowable if they do. The problem being it's hard to get a common curriculum, so many states refrain from using such a test. In New York, there was a case, Sharif versus the New York State Department of Education. In New York, students were receiving scholarships to college 
if they scored above a set cutoff on the SAT. Much like we talked about with the intelligence test, there are noted and historic disparities in scores on standardized tests between different cultural groups and between gender, men and women. Again, because this score on the SAT was the sole piece of information used to make decisions, the practice was ruled unconstitutional, and the courts ordered that multiple sources of data needed to be included when making scholarship decisions. This court case brought up several issues, one on gender bias. Is there a difference between men and women and how they perform on these types of tests? And what exactly the SAT is meant for? Is it a valid indicator of future success in college? If it is, in fact, designed to measure potential for success, how then are we awarding scholarships before that success even occurs? The scholarship should be awarded on past experiences and performances. The final court case we'll talk about is Soroka versus the Dayton Hudson Company. Dayton Hudson Company was the parent company that owned the Target department stores. At the time, the department stores were requiring all applicants for security guard positions to take a personality screening exam. The psych screen, which is an examination that is still available today, as part of their hiring practice. The examination included several questions that were personal in nature and went beyond the boundaries of what the position described. In particular, there were several questions related to sexual preference, and religious and spiritual beliefs. Because these types of items did not provide information that would accurately determine or not a person could be a good security guard, they were ruled unconstitutional and could not be included in a screening. The hiring practices were changed and the components of the interview and application process more closely aligned to what was expected of the individual on the job. So each of these are examples of where testing and assessment practices were misused that resulted in certain individuals or groups of people being disenfranchised or unfairly treated. Although courts overruled these and changed these practices, the perception remained that testing is a very speculative practice that individuals need to be alert and aware of how it could be affecting them. So as we assess clients and begin implementing assessments and testing into our practice, we need to be aware of bias. We want to make sure that we are not unfairly advantaging or disadvantaging any particular group. Sources of bias could come from many different areas. There could be content bias, whereas the test material is more familiar to one group than another. There could be internal structural bias, where the scoring of the instrument is more reliable for one group but not the other. And predictive bias, where the instrument overpredicts or underpredicts a group's performance. There are many who argue that an exam like the GRE has very little predictive ability.
The correlation between scores on the GRE and actual grades in a graduate program is very low. For a test that is designed to predict performance in graduate school, it really does a poor job. So how can we promote fairness, inequality in our practices? Well, first we should remember that our primary goal is to promote the welfare of the client. The inclusion of tests should be based on what's in the best interest of the client. We should engage in professional development opportunities, constantly seeking to update our skill set. We should continually monitor and challenge our personal belief systems and our attitudes regarding diversity. Being able to work with a changing population that's becoming more diverse along many different aspects. And then putting into practice this new culturally sensitive belief set. Truly treating our clients as individuals and working with them on a case-by-case -case basis will help to ensure equality and fairness in our assessment practices.